I just like to say with all my heart, fair use in your caboose bone. Yeah, man, this is a good little shot right here. We just talking K or we talking Ka. So you got this Kang character coming out. You know, we've been talking Blue Marvel. They still ain't made no Blue Marvel movie. They don't want to show you this naga in full naga them popping off. <laughs> then you got this Kang character. And, you know, we got before in that Marvel drop how the Prester John, yeah, there's a Prester John character in Marvel. We know he's supposed to be this Abyssinian Rex Nick Goose. We know Preston John. And who is Preston John? Abyssinia, Ethiopia. So they can't even front that this is a Naga, right? That this is a so-called Negro. Preston John. And he's supposed to be going to war with Cain, just like King David went to war with Genghis Khan. So is it Cain or is this a Genghis Khan in the Marvel world? Who went to war with King David in 1202? We know they're basing a lot of this stuff on fact, my nigga. And look how, at least in this shot, I'm going to back it up, but you're going to see. He goes from having this blue face to having this naga face. <laughs> they're really showing you in Hollywood how like, a lot of their blue people, like Avatar, are really so-called black people. And this blueness, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's something to it. We gotta do some recon. But we know it goes back in antiquity with these blue people being painted on the walls like in India and all this other stuff, right? Or is it just cold word? They don't want you to show, they don't want to show you that they're just talking about the Negro. <laughs> um, but they have a Negro playing Kang. They got a Negro playing Kang. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but <laughs> they kind of show you a lot, right? Just think about it like if this was Genghis Khan, like the invaders, you know what I'm saying? You know what they might look like. Um, I'm kind of thinking about old Charlesy boy, you know, black ass King Charles, you know, black ass King Charles Canto, Charles Canto, you know, Charles the fifth love to real history www.com hey man run it man let's go man <laughs> ah you know this is just for fun you know, let, me, let me let me reload this thing there we go okay all right this is just for fun <laughs> just notice something and you know i'm not really a, a phenotype type i'm not really a phenotype type of guy <laughs> but hollywood's funny man just I don't know, man. I see a resemblance, man. Uh, maybe I'm tripping, man. <laughs> like, drop a tripping, man. I don't know, man. Y'all, what y'all think, man? Uh, hold on, where is it? <laughs> oh, man, hold up, man. Oh, there we go. Got a resemblance of old Charlesy boy, man. Is this gang, is Genghis Khan King Charles V, man? Tell me I'm tripping, man. Tell me I'm tripping, man. <laughs> Tell me I'm tripping, man. Minus the blue eyes. Minus the blue eyes. He got a, he got a char. He got a Holy Roman Emperor feel to it, man. Yeah, this is who rode up on us. This is who conquered us, and this is who rode up on Prester John. Oh man. <laughs> Yeah, look how they got the Preston looking with the blondie locks, man. Stop playing, man. You know what the Preston look like. You know what the Preston look like? Man, we just talking about Preston John. Hey, man, um, <laughs> I got some good news on the Preston John series. Uh, you know, I wanted to continue uh, the next Preston John. Well, I think we're on 103 or 104. Directly on 4832thedrop.com. You know, we are going through some development still with the website. So what I'm going to do is at least drop the next couple of Preston Johns still right here on the tube, my knockers. So, hey, hop to the cons, man. Look out for Preston John. Whatever it is, 104, something like that coming in hot. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> Who knows what's popping up 
in the drop <laughs> on the drop desk, man. Yeah, man. We're talking about the real noggies, man. Yeah, man. You know what Press John looked like, man. I uh, thought I had the uh oh yeah, it's the Kyrie drop. Thought I still had to press the press the photo up, man. Oh uh, man, okay. Man, you know what President John looked like, man. I'm not even gonna insult you. You know, thinking you don't know what the Preston John looked like, man. So let's read some of this history, man. So Dane Whitman in the body of Ebor Garrington encountered a crusader. Whoa, this is just a lot going on. It's kind of sounding like Avatar, right? <laughs> so he's in the body of somebody else. All right? Encountering a crusader named Preston John. Here we go. And Preston John's battling the Muslim warriors. All right, so it's no, oh, Islam, brother. You know, we these Nuggets been battling these other Nuggets because we got our own power. The power of Hashra is not the power these other nations is rocking with. They know that. We know that. So it causes this, you know what I'm saying, um, battle for territory. Promised land. The Black Knight helped John. So we got a Black Knight, okay, helping Preston John or King David overcome his attackers. He's being attacked and brought him to the Crusader camp. They then prevented an assassination attempt on Richard the Lionhearted. After the Crusades, John traveled the world until he found the Isle of Avalon. There he gained the evil eye, which kind of reminds me of the golden apple, apple of Eden drop we just dropped. Because this evil eye, just like the apple, is technology. Um, look, I don't know a lot about comics and Marvel, but I'm getting interested because I'm just talking about Preston Chuck. So this device actually split into pieces and spread throughout the globe. Wait, let's back it up. We're over here playing with us. All right. So place in the care of Preston John until it seemingly exploded. Got it. The device actually split into six pieces, spread throughout the globe, becoming the focal point of the Avenger Defender War. So all the Crusades popped off looking for Preston John, right? They were looking for Preston John for how long? 500 years. 1145 to 1645. This is just the seafarers from Portugal. This is off the coast of uh, South Africa. They said if they Portuguese flow looking for Preston John crossing the Atlantic, what man do you look for for 500 years unless he's in suspended animation or has the fountain of youth? Right? I mean, we just at the, <laughs> at the beginning and the end of the day. We're just talking about Preston John. You know what Preston John look like. Stop being crazy around here. You know what the Preston look like. But God for Preston 104. We go in there. We've been going in for over seven years, man. <laughs> and it's a pleasure because we do it at our own pace. Um, you know, it's a very sacred flow. No one can duplicate it. It comes from the hard bone of Drop Nation, and that's just where it is. And we searching for Hawaii. We're keeping it cold. And Kanda, we, King David. AKA Priest King Prester John. But we also talking Moshe as a priest king. Joshua as a priest king, right? So we, we're searching for all the priests pressed the Khan cause, man. Found right here, the Amaru Khan of India Superior. You know what the Preston look like. Stop playing, man. So Cain Kang and attacked, right? You know, he's, he's battling the Muslims. He's battling the Christians. They all want to convert him. They all want to do all these things. But really, they're looking for the technologies. They've been searching for 500 years for the technologies. Placed in the care of the Preston. They say it's split into six pieces, spread throughout the world, right? And that became the focal point 
of not just the Crusades, <laughs> but the Avenger Defenders War, the More and More War. Because the Avenger Defender, Avenger Defenders War is the More and More War. You got Nagas on both sides, right? On one side, you got this Kang. He's over there doing the time travel thing. Then we start this talking about time travel. Superman going east and west, clockwise, counterclockwise. Are you in the classroom or not? We've been talking time travel. They're also talking time travel. That's crazy. Right? They've been talking time travel. <laughs> time travel seems to be a very important thing. Quantum seems to be a very important thing. Witnessing a particle changing its behavior by witnessing it. The fact that a particle knows it's being observed is an interesting thing. Kong or Kang or Gang is Kong because it's a more and more war. <laughs> Let's go. What happened? So later, Preston John carried a new version of the evil eye called the Stellar Rod. Now you got the staff, right? <laughs> the Stellar Rod. Evil eye is made of an unknown metal. <laughs> they don't even know what type of metal it is it must be something else right but the prester got it the prester got it huh prester john he got the dragon <laughs> he got the staff he got the stellar rod <laughs> all right all right they call it the evil eye it's like an etymology that's what they would call the dragon right And like I said, fair use in your caboose bone. We're about to go in on Kang. On Kang. <laughs> it's about time. Uh, dragon. Etymology, right? So instead of evil eye, right, and drag, with dragon and etymology, they would call it the, uh, come on. Perhaps in a literal sense, the one with the deadly Glance, my nigga. Ping, pow. We on the ass, man. We on the ass. Look out for Preston 104. Wait, do we do 103? Yeah. Whichever one, man. Look out for it, man. All right? We popping off, man. This is a pleasure. It's an honor. It's not It's not something you do just to, you know, pop off, man. It's an honor to talk Priest King. It's an honor to search for Preston John. Because he got the deadly glance. He got the evil eye. <laughs> what do they mean, evil eye? They mean that you can see clearly, man. Because a dragon in etymology means that you can see. And what does seeing have to do with the apple of Eden? And the free will or the intelligence or whatever the case is of eating from the fruit? Did it make you see clearly? Oh, I said, who told you you wasn't wearing clothes? <laughs> Did it make you see clearly? Did it make things more visible? You got tapped too, uh, you know, too close to the deadly glance, you know, maybe closer than you were supposed to. It wasn't that Hawaii wanted to keep you blind. It's that a baby needs to get one thing at a time, man. You can't feed a baby chicken, you know. Baby need milk. Yeah, you, you're going to see, but you can't show your children everything at once, right? There's a flow to it. <laughs> That's all it is. It's order over chaos. Oh, well, I know you're going to see one day, but how are you going to see? Clearly. The one with the deadly glance. Let's go. So it's more and more war, right? You got Genghis Khan on one side or Khan, Khan on one side. You got the Preston on the other side. You got the Preston on one side. You got old Charlesy boy on the other side. And what's he doing? Hijacking. The Inca line, the Inca Kings list got all the OG Nagas, even 
mama hawak mama kapak sapa inka mama hawak hawa hawak and it depicts Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, Charles Kento, as the first European emperor, my naga. This nigga's a European. This nigga's a European. So go back and read the 1828 Webster Dictionary with these originals found here by the European. They, you were found here by black people, man. <laughs> and these black people cut you off from being a nation and use the so-called white man as a straw man to this day. Because Cain got the drop on the time travel, boss. People say, well, where did they go? They got the time travel drop. Where They go wherever they want to go, right? <laughs> He's the first European emperor, Charles. And I can't, I'm just saying I see resemblances, man. I see resemblances, man. And he starts blue like the avatar, man. Bang, right? Bang. So, all right. We just talking Kang, the evil eye, the deadly glance. All right. We we touched on some of this with the blue marvel flow, but some of y'all getting like it's the first time. What's this got to do with time travel, boss? We've been talking Superman and time travel. Let's put it together. Drop. Let's go. Let's focus. <laughs> Let's go. The evil eye is made of an unknown metal. Just like a dragon. You know, I keep... Look, this is all... It's got dragon all over it, man. I'm sorry, man. It's got dragon all over it, man. Uh, uh, what's it called? Black Draco. It's got dragon all over it, man. You know, this whole alchemy, you know, situation that we've been talking about with these dragons. You know, I mean, love to Miss D and the Awakening, man. Uh, who was it? Dragon Science? Let's find it together, man. We talked about the alchemies. Mythologies, theories, let's see. That's a great, man, a really, really great resource, especially when you start talking dinosaurs. It's going to let you know, you know, this whole dinosaur situation. <laughs> the problem stems not from the evidence, but from the word. The word dinosaurs did not exist until 1841 when it was coined by Sir Robert Owen. So, before they called them dinosaurs, they just referred to them as dragons, saying that dragons are dinosaurs would be erroneous, even if man was proven to have lived alongside of dinos. So I think we're starting to see clearly on that. I think my nod is just kidding, man. I'm trying to find this alchemy drop. Y'all help me out, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, Got the anatomies. Oh man, they got dragon sightings. Chinese versus Japanese. Man, you know, oh the Rainbow Serpent Temple. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta get back in here, Miss D <laughs> and the Copper Color Awakening. Let's see if I can uh oh, man, search box don't work. All right, all right, all right. Here we go. What is a dragon? Hey, look out for dragon analogy 101, man, popping right back off on you. Because these are things, you know, it's good to at least have a basis of how it goes, and you know, way deeper. And that's why I'm looking for the alchemy. It's not... You know, it goes beyond dinosaur and, and reptile. And, you know what I mean? All that. It really gets into the energy, to the frequency, to the vibration. This thing got a whole list of dragons. And every 
single, you know, area alphabetically, you know, or at least a whole bunch of area. <laughs> or I could have just typed in alchemy. Come on, man. Come on, try. Oh, it's under the topics. Oh, okay, see, I didn't know. So y'all should have said hit the topics, drop. Hit the topics. All right, let's get to the alchemy of it because they're talking about an unknown metal for the evil eye. And just like, you know, dragon is to see clearly one with the deadly glance, evil eye. There's also this, you know, correlation that we like to always come back to with the alchemical dragon versus the alchemical serpent, right? So you got an alchemical serpent. This represents their AI. We got to get back on artificial technology. Represents the impersonal nature of the unconscious as it bursts into consciousness. So the dragon is not the serpent. You can't have an alchemical serpent and an alchemical dragon and then tell me with a straight face that the dragon is the serpent. We're not talking about impersonal nature. We're not talking about the bringing together of opposite witchcraft, necromancy, the conientio. Uh, they bring our opposites to slay the dragon. They got to bring you the opposite to slay the dragon. Bloods and crypts, right? Red on blue, right? They got to put opposites against each other, man. Yeah. <laughs> I think we see the play. We see their image of union of king and queen as an androgynous God. We see their baphomet. We see their androgyny. Yeah. The cosmic serpent is everything and nothing at the same time. Huh? It brings everything to life, but also kills everything, boss. Now we ain't talking about the dragon. The serpent kills everything. The serpent kills everything. The dog-headed side of Sophia kill everything. The dragon represents the philosophical quicksilver. Unlike Thoth or Mercury, the philosophical quicksilver is a mysterious substance of unknown origin. Now, what's the chances that this will have an unknown origin? Mysterious, mysterious substance. We're talking... One with the deadly glance. We're talking dragon. They're talking evil eye. We're talking one with the deadly glance. We're all talking dragon. Because the evil eye is made of an unknown metal. Right? An unknown metal like this mysterious substance of unknown origin. <laughs> So this technology has a lot of alchemical dragon qualities, is all we say. From this quicksilver, the living spirit can be extracted. So the dragon is representing the living spirit. Now it says, oh, it does. The dragon does not represent the living spirit, but it is the vessel in which the spirit is contained. Well, then if the dragon is the vessel that contains the spirit, then it's also representative of the spirit. <laughs> See, I just be talking double talk. The dragon doesn't represent the living spirit, but it is the vessel in which the spirit is contained. What? <laughs> then it represents that Ruah. It's containing it. It's shielding it like the code, like keeping the code. The code is a dragon. It contains the vessel. It can, it's the vessel that contains the living spirit, the Ruah. But we're talking about an unknown substance. Unknown origin. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, because they try to slay the Preston like they tried to slay the dragon. How, boss? By the coming together of opposites, whatever you make of that. You're on the black and white checkerboard, right? Black and white, black and white. Coming together of opposites can slay the dragon, the alchemical dragon. Okay. 
So the evil eye or the one with the daily glance, we're just talking about seeing clearly. Unknown metal, evil eye got the unknown substance, right? It is capable of manipulating matter at the molecular level. That, that seems a lot like that apple Eden flow, you know, uh, controlling free will, thoughts, some type of time travel situation. So this stellar rod, this staff that the Prester got, can manipulate matter at the molecule level, man. <laughs> at the conscious level, man. At the quantum level. Firing concussive force blasts, disintegrating matter, nullifying other energy sources, and creating or destroying force fields. So with this stellar ride with Moses' staff, he can create a force field. He can destroy a force field. Disintegrate matter. He can do a lot more than separate the waters from the waters and have you cross on dry land. <laughs> Crossing the Jordan. He can do more than that. Joshua made the sun stand still, remember? It made the moon stand still. The evil eye possesses dimensional time travel abilities as well. It had a safety button that charged it, but if the button was left on, the power would rapidly rise to dangerous levels, causing it to explode. The eye would be broken into six similar bits when it exploded. So it has a safety button that charges it. But if the button is left on, the power will rapidly rise to dangerous levels. So someone left the safety button on. <laughs> it exploded into six pieces and they would be pushed through the earth until they met sunlight again. So they all pretty much went in the earth, underground. Okay. We're just talking about the evil eye because... Preston John has the deadly glance. He has the dragon, the one with the deadly glance. <laughs> there he gained the evil eye. God. As a plague seemed to wipe out the citizens of Avalon, I'm prepared to sit upon the seat of survival. All right, this is more technology, which would place him, man, Shalak, man, all right, check it, which would place him. And suspended animation. And don't act like you ain't never heard of suspended animation. You read the Bible. You read the Bible. They do sus they suspend and animate all the time. <laughs> ain't that what it happened with Moshe in Deuteronomy 34? You know, when he's passing his life force, he's laying hands on Joshua. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, the dragon, the vessel. For Moses had laid his hands on. Something about the laying of his hands, the passing of his frequency, filled Joshua with mama. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim. He's talking about evil eye. <laughs> Daily glance. Nah. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated, which means lessened or taken away. How can you die and your eye is not dim? How can you die and your natural force is not lessened or taken away. What kind of death is that? Are we just talking about suspended animation? Huh? We just talking suspended animation. Okay. 
All right. So Presta John jumps in this technology called, called the Seed of Survival, which puts him in suspended animation. <laughs> All right. So where's the Presta? Where's David? You know, where are the, you know, um, elites? You know what I'm saying? Do they have the time travel flow? What technology do they have? Do they have the Apple of Eden? There's a lot we don't know. We So we damn sure could ask some questions, man. It says, so he, he goes into suspended animation. However, Kang appears. So Kang comes and starts jamming up President John, right? <laughs> All right. Kang pops up and starts jamming up the Prester. The Prester goes into suspended animation. Maybe this is when Genghis Khan was supposed to be taking over. Like, all right, man. It's just time for you to take the wheel. I'll be over here until it's time for me to pop off again. I'm in suspended animation. <laughs> I mean, it, it's all happening, right? The blue people turning the Negroes. <laughs> Cool, cool. I could dig it. I could dig it. So Kang appears. Kang comes. Kang starts popping off, trying to get John to join him. That's interesting because same thing happened with Genghis Khan. You know, at first he wanted to marry into the David family. He wanted to join forces to fight against these other hijacks. You know what I'm saying? But you know, David recognized that yo, this this was a lot of cover that's going on. <laughs> So he pulled, you know, pulled back and said, look, man, you know, I can't let you marry my daughters. You're not a David, bro. You know, I, I took you into the family. Me and your father was, was, you know, they called them blood brothers because they protected each other like a blood oath. But they weren't literally blood. You know what I mean? So Genghis Khan was like a nephew to the Preston. But Genghis Khan wanted the Khan and Preston John knew that. So he wanted his David. He wanted David's daughter so he could legitimize himself in the family. And when he didn't accept him doing that, they went to war. Here it skips over all that. It just says Kang appeared trying to get John to join him as a result of their battle. So apparently John said no. In, in, in the real time, King David said, nah, man, I'd rather burn my daughters than give them to you. Cause I see you trying to hijack the car. You ain't got no respect over there, Genghis Kang. Genghis Khan. <laughs> As a result of their battle, John was sent to the past. John was sent to the past as a result of the battle. Did he send himself to the past? Because he already has the technology. He attempted to manipulate events in the past, advising a Frankish king to battle Vikings. Now, we got a lot of uh, recon, you know, that combines the Franks and the Anrus and the Rus and the kings of Jerusalem and all that. So we got to get on the pig series. I know Pix is coming in hot because that's where we're going with this. So you see this teaming up of Israel, you know, and the Franks and Israel. You know, over here. So, um, you know, the, the Rus, the Russians, Kiev Rus, Clancy All Andreas, you know what I mean? He was stopped by Thunderstrike acting as Thor. So, all these hijacks in the Marvels, a lot of them were fighting against Presta John, right? <laughs> this is what they'll make him look like uh, today in Marvel, like a blondie blondie, right? <laughs> but we know we look at that. El Presta Y. It's a more and more war. Yeah. Okay. So they stop at Thor, you know, who was in town investigating, or who was investigating a town king had reverted to medieval times. Medieval times, right? That, that's just what? 1200s, Gen Genghis Khan? Yeah. <laughs> a boat from Meljornir somehow triggered the eye to teleport John back to Avalon. So they getting teleported. I mean, we got more on this before. I'm just I'm just interested in this king. Cuz I didn't know that he was a brother. I didn't know that they would just depict him as a brother 
these days, you know. Write it on Facebook, and he goes from blue to brown on this right here. Blue to brown. You know, his real name is Nathan R Nathaniel Richards, okay. Here's a quote from Kang. It says, story is not written, scholar, and neither is destroyed. History is made, made by the deeds of the strong, the brave. The destiny is forged. The story is the students, the gray beards. They come in the wake of the strong and write down what the brave have done. But it is the conquerors who change the world. So he's called Kang the Conqueror. Like Kang is Khan? Come on, man. Come on, man. It's too similar to the Preston John Kang is Khan invasion. Whether you know he's King David or not, Preston John, Genghis Khan plays because he called himself King David after 1202, after the invasion. He took the title David. He took the title Preston. So if you're reading about Preston John after 1202, like 1220s, you're probably talking Genghis Khan still. Or King David, you're probably still talking Genghis Khan. He stole the title King David. He stole the title Preston John. He wanted to be a David. He wanted to be a Preston. He wanted to change the world as a conqueror. So here they got him. They got him, you know, in his spiral vortex of time. <laughs> Notice the circular patterns of time travel. East and west, right? And he's a blue man. So I didn't know he was a black man. You know, I didn't know he was a black man. <laughs> and I didn't know this brother would look so similar <laughs> to this brother. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. Is Holy Roman... Look, here, here's, here's my thesis. Because Kang is going back in time. He has many different timelines. Marvel is real good on telling you all these different timelines. So, in one timeline, can Genghis Khan be Holy Roman Emperor Charles V? That's all I'm saying. They're all conquerors, right? Just pay attention to the similarity. Could this be, you know, a Christopher Columbus flow? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it all, or, you know, are they all one thing or working together? Or, you know, I mean, we know Columbus was coming with orders from the king. We know that, you know, and this is the king. This is the conqueror. This is the king. This is the king. And the same K is a conqueror jamming up the Presta. Jamming up Presta John. King David, who got the scepter or the stellar rod, evil eye, deadly glance, dragon, right? And with this dragon, he was able to go into suspended animation. And then Kane came, started jamming him up. Then he had to go back in the past and something else happened. <laughs> so, so Nathan Richards had various incarnations over the years. And each identity has its own ever-expanding history. So various incarnations. I know what that means. This is not out the picture. If he's going back in the past, taking all these different lives, why wouldn't he take the life of this hijacked city? Why wouldn't this be Kang? Why wouldn't this be Genghis Khan? Holy Roman Emperor. Hijacking. Hijacking the Inca, hijacking the Nagas and Nagavir. Why wouldn't this be Kang? Huh? He had various incarnations over the years. Each identity has its own ever-expanding history. For the sake of clarity, this article will only cover essentially the history of Nathan Richards during this time as Kang. For more information on the other identities of Nathan Nathaniel Richards, please refer to the entries on Iron Lad, Kid Immortalis, or Immortus, Scarlet Centurion, 
Rama Tut. Uh oh. Uh oh, boss. That sounds very Egyptian to me. With permission of the Pharaoh. What's it got to do with the Tuts, huh? <laughs> Uh-oh, boss. Uh-oh, boss. Various incarnations. Man, okay. In addition, there are many alternative versions of Kang in existence. For the sake of clarity, it is commonly accepted that each alternative, alternate Kang that has interacted with Earth-616 or this particular Earth pod, my naga, which could be Earth-616, <laughs> is a direct divergence from the prime king of Earth 6311. So there's a prime king, like Optimus Prime. There's all kind of kings, man. And some of these kings are kings. You know? The last black king of Spain, some of these Kings are kings. <laughs> All these are Nagas painted over iconoclastic, iconoclasm 101. Look out, uh, look at his forehead. <laughs> Hi, Jack and the Naga. All right, man. So let's just take it into, you know, some of these great drives, man. Love to, uh, Everybody I'm about to feature quickly. You know, I'm just going to belly flat. Emergency awesome. You know what I'm saying? We're going to get some of this CBR. A little bit of this new rock star flow. Uh, some more emergency awesome. Uh, some comments explain and do a dismount with the homie. Dope spill comics, man. He be breaking it down. He's going to bring in the Venom flow. Eddie Brock, you know what I mean? So let's get some minutes on. You know, some uh, minutes of focus in and it's crazy with this blue stuff, man, because it just reminds me of this avatar flow, man, you know. I mean, you know what the avatars look like. But <laughs> oh, man, come on. I check it. Sing the song chords to remember. You know what they look like, man, but you know, yeah, go get that drop, go get that drop. So, what's it got to do with Avatar, man? Time travel, let's go, man. Emergency also, take the wheel, fair use, in your caboose bowl, man. Let's do some uh, scholarship teaching, new support. I gotta say it, man, I gotta say it. Let's get it. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. We have a brand new Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania scene to break down of Kang and his time travel ship. And hey, look, it's about to get real nerdy, man. So put on your nerd glasses <laughs> and let's get this drop on Kang. A bunch of cool Easter eggs and connections to the Fantastic Four, even to Doctor Doom. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. In the scene they release, we get a way better high risk. Look at this Naga. Look at him. Look at this dog. I gotta take a picture, man. He looks so clean. And that super suit. High tech naga, huh? Oh, you a high tech naga, huh? Look at Kang and his time ship, man. Kang pop it off. Yeah, man, I see you, Kang. Let's get it. I res, nice shiny look at Kang's time travel ship and his armor. It looks just like the comic book version. I love the way they did his suit. He's got a bunch of different types of technology here in the quantum realm in the trailer that serve different purposes. The giant city is based on the comic book version of Chronopolis, the city that he rules over in the distant future, which they also use as inspiration for the TBA. But I think that's going to wind up being a different variant of Kang. So like each has their own different spin on a lot of the comic book Easter eggs. But in the MCU, in this movie, this King the Conqueror variant uses this place not just as a regular city to house his army or as a giant fortress. It's also meant to be a giant device that he uses to control the entire multiverse, like his master plan for using Quantum Realm to win the King. It sounds a lot like the Apple of Eden, mind control, control your free will, free thought. Multiverse war. The actual giant golden chair that he's sitting in here looks really comfy. Like, there's actually a seat behind him here, too. Like, the seat that he sits in, and then another passenger seat behind him. 
You have to picture a variant of Ravana Renslayer sitting back there with him. This chair is his actual personal time travel ship that he uses to jump around to different timelines. Ooh, kind of like the Seed of Survival. Did he steal the Seed of Survival? You got a suspending animation time travel ship. This is how he, so what do you think? It spins, something spins around him or he spins east to west, right? It's like the actual ship itself. It's based on a couple of his time travel ships in the comics, most notably his original time travel ship from the Fantastic Four number 19 back in 1963. There's a couple separate Easter eggs here connections to the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom. The other big connection to the Fantastic Four, you notice in the trailer, he's wielding the blue colored quantum energy. It even seems like he's integrated into his biology. Like Whoa, so is the blue representing quantum energy? Avatar indigenous Naga flow. His eyes glow blue when he takes his mask off. He gives it off in black, shooting Ant Man, trying to kill him. Blue Marvel. It's the same type of blue colored quantum energy that Mr. Fantastic used in Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness in the 838 universe. Mm -hmm. I don't think that means that this King the Conqueror variant came from the 838 universe, but that would be another cool connection if he was. This variant of Kang the Conqueror isn't meant to be the 616 MCU version either, so he is from another universe. The version of Kang that came from the regular MCU universe's future was the He Who Remains variant. Anaga, this is Charles. The fifth, man. <laughs> We're breaking down the time travel element behind this character, Charles the Fifth. He's really gay as calm, man. <laughs> right of your face, man. Variant of King. He's, He's the, the first, first one King King Multiverse War. War because, because Kevin Feige, Feige, the Marvel producer, said that the sacred, sacred timeline that he had, had been ruling over for all of time, time covered pretty, pretty much everything, everything that we've seen in all the Marvel movies and TV shows up to that point. point. Everything, Everything that, that had happened, happened on screen had, had happened inside the sacred timeline. timeline. So, so still big question, question which universe this King, King the Conqueror variant, variant the more evil one, one came from. from. King is also meant to be a descendant of Reed Richards, Richards many, many thousands of years removed. His original name was Nathaniel Richards. We got a little bit of his backstory from the Eager Remains variant of King. All of them have very similar backstories with subtle differences that lead them to different ends. Like some of them wind up being way more evil than the others, as he teased during the episode. And then, if you think, think I'm, I'm evil, evil, just this wait. way. Do you meet me? Ah, there it is. Did you change the kill the devil? Right? Right? Hey. Well, oh, guess what? what? I, I keep, keep you safe. Going, going from, from the Fantastic, Fantastic Four King connection, connection because of them. You said you can't kill the devil, but I keep you safe, so. Just gonna let that sit right there. Using similar types of energy, they also based Mr. Fantastic's quantum energy here on Doctor Doom's time travel platform in the comics. This is Michael Waldron, the writer, and Sam Raimi, the director, talking about that. Shadow Lynch, Shadow Lynch was pleasure to work with Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. So was John. Hello, Stephen. Teleportation device he uses to get into the scene is something we took from the comics. That's Doctor Doom's uh, Doctor Doom's uh, time door, time platform. And while it is not Professor X's first time on screen, it is the first time we see that cover uh, chair from the animated series. Reed Richards is my favorite Marvel Comics character, so it was a real honor to write his first entry, I guess, here in the MCU. I don't know if they ever planned on Doctor Doom actually being in the movie. That would have been really cool, but there was meant to be a version who existed in the 838 universe, and that's how Mr. Fantastic came up with some of the ideas of how to use quantum energy this way. So you just have a lot of people using the same type of quantum energy in the same way. Originally, when Kang discovered time travel in alternate universes, the multiverse, he was just a regular scientist and historian. Just a regular guy living in the distant future. One day he winds up discovering plans for Doctor Doom's time travel platform, which to him had been built thousands of years ago, way more primitive. So he takes Doctor Doom's plans for his time ship, upgrades everything with hypertech with the future tech he has access to, tests it with his first mission being to go back to ancient Egypt, pretending to be the Rama Tut version of his character. They actually had Rama Tut Easter eggs during the Moon Knight episodes, and I believe there are going to be some Rama Tut Easter eggs in the Loki Season 2 trailer. I've already done a video about that, so I'll link it at the end of this and down in the description below. 
There were also some Ramata Easter eggs during the end of Loki Season 1 as well. Like, he had a bunch of artifacts all over his office there from... Ramata, right? So, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. <laughs> he's always on the wrong side of things, whether he's Charles V or he's Rama, Rama, Tut in Egypt. He's always conquering, always enslaving the Hebrews. It's always a more and more war, and you always see clearly what side he's on. Conquering the Inca. Conquering the Hebrew. From his different adventures all across the timeline, he even had an Iron Man helmet in the background, too. Just letting you know that he'd actually faced a version of the Avengers at some point in his timeline. When Kang grew tired of ruling over the past, he set up the mutant Apocalypse as his successor and returned to the future. Apocalypse later made a deal with the Celestials for their technology. That's how he got all of his armor, his ship. They kind of did a version of that during X-Men the Animated Series. That's where The Celestials would be, you know... The uh, more and more, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> the, the Confederacy, you know what I mean, uh, Saturn and, and, and Mars and, you know, all that flow, you know what I'm saying. They all go to under the firmament celestial. That's where they get their power. The celestial is just underneath the dome, right? So they don't have power above the dome. That's that's Hawa. That's, that's for you. That's your power. Only you can access the mighty throne room of Hawa. They can only access everything under the ceiling, right? The stars are within the ceiling. The planets to make devious, right? <laughs> Etymology of planet, look it up. Plain, flat, spread out. Devious. That's where his spaceship came from, why he has that in the distant past, because the Celestials built it. Early apocalyptic scholars referred to, and I quote, a mighty ship designed by creatures from beyond the stars. The next time Kang returned, he came to the present day of the Avengers to try and defeat them, this time using the actual Kang the Conqueror name and wearing that same armor for the first time. And throughout his timeline, he lose some against the Avengers, win some, coming back in different points in his timeline, using different names with different upgrades, different identities. Mm -hmm. He became the sort of centurion. There was a child version. There we go. <laughs> There's Mr. Egypt, man, Mr. Atlantis. Let's go. Of Kang, who became Iron Lad on the Young Avengers. So when they try to move around with permission of the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh at that time would be Charles V, who was actually the Pharaoh under this Tut situation. You know what I'm saying? So, damn. It's the same people in rulership, right? I mean, who the hell was Obama, man? We don't know, man. We don't know. It's the same people. Than Kid Immortus when that Kid Kang tried to become a good person. The adult version of Immortus Kang was something they did during the Loki series. He Who Remains Kang was a combination of the Immortus version of Kang and He Who Remains from the comics, who was a completely different character. Immortus was meant to be Kang at the end of his timeline, who softened a little, become more of a good character, as opposed to the Kang the Conqueror version that we see in the trailer, who's just a full-blown Avengers villain. The whole idea with this Kang in the MCU is that he winds up capturing Cassie Lang to force Ant-Man to help him steal a device back that was stolen by Janet Van Dyne when she escaped that will help him complete his time ship so that he can go on winning the Kang multiverse war. Apparently the reason why he was stuck in the Quantum Realm in the first place is because Janet Van Dyne, she discovered him when she got stuck there. Initially he lied about who he was, what he was doing there, in order to survive while she was there, she created her own fortress in the Quantum Realm, and I believe that's what this place is here, the wreckage of this place. They worked together for a time, Kang manipulating her into helping him use the Quantum Realm to win the Kang Multiverse War, and when she discovered who he really was and what his plans were, she sabotaged his time travel ship, and that's the reason why Kang needs their help. He wants to force Janet Van Dyne to reveal what she did with the missing piece, and have Scott help him retrieve it so that he can go on winning the Kang Multiverse War. It sounds like a lot of that plot has something to do with this giant device that looks like Shang-Chi's Ten Rings of Power. I just did a video on this because this seems just like a giant version of Shang-Chi's Ten Rings. So it does seem like Kang is the person who built the Ten Rings. That's where the signal is transmitting to in the Shang-Chi post credit scene. It also seems like he built Miss Marvel's bangles, too. I think they... Whoa. Okay, three, that's so... Come on, man. It's crazy talk, man. I mean, who designs this stuff? I Only think the idea is that when... 
So this brother designed all that high tech, high tech, all the rings from that other series. What do they call it? Shri. Uh, you know, I'm about to get it back. All this design by high tech nuggets, right? All this ancient, ancient technology. It also seems That'd like he built Miss Marvel's bangles, bangles too. too. I think, I think the idea is that when Ant-Man, Ant-Man is trying to destroy the two in the, the Shang Chi post credit scene, it also, it also seems, seems like he built Miss Marvel's bangles, bangles too. too. I think, I think the, the idea is that when Ant-Man, Ant-Man is trying to destroy this device, device they're saying that it's, it's the key to Kang's, Kang's master plan to win the Kang multiverse war. How he plans on beating all the other Kang variants and making his own timeline supreme. The only, the only thing they haven't revealed, revealed in all the trailer footage, footage, all the interviews, is, is why Kang is, is doing all this. Like, why does he want to win the Kang multiverse war? One of the, One of the really big differences between Kang and Thanos, Thanos is that Kang is as much at war with his other variants as he is with the Avengers. Like, like he's at war with himself, metaphorically and literally, in a way that Thanos never was. The whole idea is that it's meant to be a multiverse saga, Marvel Phase 4, Phase 5, and Phase 6, so he's trying to win the Kang multiverse war 2.0 because he remains one of the first version of that was... Why would Genghis Khan be at war with himself? Unless by the by doing the time travel, you keep creating all these alternative wow. alternative views. Why? Why? Now you got alternative Genghis Khans all over the place, and as a real conqueror, you want to be the main conqueror. So now you got to be at war with yourself in the multiverse. <laughs> Let's get one more minute. Let's get some more. It was preventing. 2.0 from starting, but once Sylvie killed him, the timeline rebooted and it allowed all the other timelines to be freed and the other evil versions of Kang to rise up. If you think I'm bad, wait till you meet my variants. This Kang the Conqueror just happens to be one of those worst variants, but not the only one that we'll see. There will be another version of Kang during Loki Season 2. I've already done a full Loki Season 2 trailer video, like I said, for all the footage they've already released. I'll put a link for that at the end of this down in the description. But the next big Marvel series is actually Secret Invasion, and that won't be super connected to Loki Season 2 or what Kang is doing just in general. It's setting up more of an Earth-based Marvel Phase 5 story, which is a version of Dark Reign from the comics, where the scrolls try to take over the world and Secret Invasion, the villains take credit for getting rid of them and ride that newfound popularity to try and take over the world themselves. I think we're supposed to get the next Secret Invasion trailer during the Super Bowl or around that time. As soon as they release it, of course I'll do a video for it. The Secret Invasion episodes will drop around April or May after the Mandalorian Season 3 episodes. The other big reminder is that the Last of Us episodes on HBO are starting this weekend. I will be doing videos for that. Be sure to check them out. It is amazing. All right. All right. Let's go. (laughs) I'm belly flopping this next one. This is a... CBR, Kane the Conqueror isn't the great threat to the multiverse. Well, let's go. Can't, Can't you, you wait until five, five years from now when we're all saying, saying Shh, remember Kane? What a chump. <laughs> Kane the Conqueror may be the biggest threat the MCU has seen so far, but trust me when I say there are much worse forces in the universe to choose from. Let's take a look at the characters who pose a bigger threat to the multiverse right now. One of the the biggest biggest baddies in the Marvel Marvel Universe is Galactus. Dude Dude could could eat our planet like one of those chocolate chocolate wonder balls. balls. And And the the prize prize inside is a dead celestial celestial turned to stone. stone. Galactus is a being of incredible celestial celestial power power whose hunger has led to the destruction of countless... Alright, I mean, this one's just gonna talk about other people they think are more threatening than Kang. But, you know, I'll leave it there for you to check out. Let's try this one. I was watching it with uh, the exact moment Kang killed Thanos, so... Did y'all know Kang scrapped with Thanos too? It's a lot happening with well, Kang. Welcome back to the Rockstars. I'm Eric Boss. And once again, we will open Marvel Base 5 with, with Kang, Kang the Conqueror as the vast cult of warring champions of the Avengers of the base. It's High Jackson and voices, I know, but let's just. I got the water flowing for it. I got the water flowing. Let me turn the water up. Alright. <laughs> let's go. But given, but given Kang's chance, chance status, status does it logically follow that he must have killed Thanos at some point? point? Or, or at many points? points? The, the casting crew are now specifically pitting Thanos versus Kang. And shout out to the brother, the actor playing Kang, man. Do your thing, man. Let's go. Cool. 
And, and when you go back to rewatch Loki, Loki Multiverse, Multiverse of Madness, Infinity War, Endgame, Endgame, you can, can actually pinpoint, pinpoint these specific Nexus moments when Kang would have targeted the Mad Titan, Titan. and I'm not going to break down what that likely assassination tells us about the surprising status of the 616 universe as we know it. In an interview with Brazilian Comic Con earlier this month, Quantumania director Peyton Reed and Hunter Rhodes compared Kang with Thanos. We're encountering an antagonist who's unlike anything they've ever experienced, and that includes Thanos. And notice, why did the end of that line? Peyton, Peyton Reed, Reed fist bumps, bumps Kang, Kang after John the Majors. Majors. Now, now Majors, Majors was otherwise tight-lipped in this interview, but was later asked about his workout regimen and, and how physical, physical he would be getting as Kang. And we, we want to know if you're going to use any of these workouts you have to do with your body on, on this, this next movie. movie. All, All of it. All of it. All of it. Like, like Hulk. Hulk. No, I'm Hulk. kidding. It's, it's funny because if you read Dynasty Kang, he doesn't fight. It's not like a brawl guy. Is that what you have in there? You're going to get all of it. <laughs> right, get all of it. That's cool. That's cool. You're gonna get all of it. I clearly want to be here, and I'm not just doing this so I won't get fined. Maybe the major just said over here in the interview. He wasn't really loud in that room, but he is indicating here. He has discussed in other interviews the wide range of characterizations he would get to create as Kang as the primary thing that drew him to this role. And while Peter Reed has described this one of Major Kang as a very conservative energy, with Major saying all of it, and it's this moment with the director that mentions him being more fearsome than Thanos, I think Major is gonna. Play, play at least, least one king who makes Thanos, Thanos say, say just that for a drop of blood. blood. Oh shit. Remember, when did the quantum media trailer footage that we've seen so far? Kang has implied he has killed countless Avengers in the past. And we, we know for sure that Kang is certainly aware of Thanos. Kang Barry, Barry and he, he remains stripped of the sacred timeline, timeline in which Thanos, Thanos was a major antagonist, and Thanos showed up in the movie episode 2 in the multiple choice question on Miss Minute's training module. Thanos has two apples. He eats both and realizes he wants more. He goes back in time 20 minutes and eats the apples again. Does this mean the apples will not have existed in the timeline he left? I don't know, because time is constantly happening. B, the question doesn't matter because the branch cannot change another time branch. Or C, Thanos would have been hungry prior because the grandfather paradox already accounted for the change of matter before it's moved. When we look back at this, the TVA ranked file seems to suggest B was the correct answer, but I don't know. By the Loki season one finale, the true answer seems actually to be all of the above. Look, what are your thoughts on this? Anyone who thinks that they firmly understand 100% the logic of Loki season one and what, what exactly happened in that finale is fooling themselves, themselves, which is why I'm actually revisiting it currently for a major project that I'm working on and announcement coming early next week. But one, one thing we do know for sure about this Kang Barry he remains is that he made an exception for the Avengers to use time travel. He remains wanted the 616 Avengers to defeat Thanos using the time ice. Friend Slayer confirmed this to Loki in episode 1. We're not here to talk about the Avengers. Oh, no. no, what they did was supposed to happen. You escaped me. Was not. Now, now, I theorized, theorized before that he remains made, made that exception so that Tony Stark would later unlock quantum time travel with that inverted Mobius strip in his basement, this, this being the discovery that Nathan Richards would later build on and master a thousand years later, and that he remains scripted being the discovery that Nathan Richards would later build that Tony Stark would later unlock quantum time travel. Notice the loops, man, like the CERN, Hadron Collider. Look at the loop. Look at the loop from east to west, west to east. They got a loop. They got to go east to west, my nigga. Let's go. Well, with, with that, that inverted movie strength, strength in his basement, basement this, this being the discovery that Nathan Richards would later build on and master a thousand years later, and that he would remain scripted this out so, out so that Stark would, would die shortly after, after so that he would have no time to dismantle that technology, technology or even throw it in the ocean, ocean like he likes to do with his tech. In fact, the more we learn about the 616 MCU, the more it starts to seem like it's less of a sacred timeline, but really an exception to the multiversal norm. 616 is like a road timeline. It's a barrier. Branch that, branch that went unthrough. The, the normal Marvel universe, universe is probably supposed to have mutants alongside Avengers, right? right? But, but he, he remains in his campaign to prove all other Kang rivals, rivals during that multiverse, multiverse of war that we talked about in the finale. finale. He, left he left one 616, 616 timeline, timeline untouched so, so that, that it would keep his own origin intact. It's basically a massive Kang tree. He remains clipped all other branches so other Kang apples fell down to the ground. And then only one branch remained in the left that he remains apple. Two high enough off the ground to hungry hungry Thanos could meet that out. I got to make some metaphors there, but I hope it made sense. Now, I'm on camera a lot, so I can see my face a lot. So you think I would have to put a lot of effort in my skincare routine? But you know what? I really don't, because I... Okay, 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 hi, Jay. No one cares about your skincare routine. Um. Yeah, 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 okay. I'm going to leave this for you. Maybe you could barely fly. 
This is back to the same uh, cat, Emergency Awesome. He's talking about Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania. My dope and Kane, which looks like the Murdoch situation. You know what I'm saying? Wow. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Wow. First, we're going to pop off with Comics Explained. Let's get it from here. Comics Explained. Talking on that K. They go. And he took me to a far off world where he cried in the shadows as a woman died. He said one word, then was silent for days. That word being Ravana. Right, of course, Ravana Renslayer. Now, the thing, the thing about this, the reason why it matters is because Ravana Renslayer was the land of the Conqueror. And she died. Right, Kane's life literally fell apart when that happened. And in fact, the way that Marvel wrote that, it was almost kind of a question of will Kane ever recover from this? He was focusing on that interpersonal side, but you don't really see it all that often. And of course, even Kane made Nathaniel swear he would never bring it up, right? Like he, he would never mention it or anything along those lines. And so what happens as he goes through this period, right? Again, back in the 65 billion years that he's here, as he goes through all of that, of course, he ends up facing off against, you know, some Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is awesome, blasts it with a, with a massive gun. <laughs> literally blows this thing's head off and what he says and this is this is where things are really really fascinating and he says he would love to say that in the aftermath of killing this t-rex that he feasted on dinosaur meat for days and he sharpened his teeth into knives right that he somehow honed his skills became this brutal warrior that could live off the land but he says that never happened and the reason why is because by the time i killed this thing all i saw was her all I saw was this one person, right? This one singular individual. And like that, she had had the complete and total attention of Hank. He never had a chance, right? Nathaniel was just smitten for this one. And so he over here killing dragons. <laughs> Run him, run into an Amazon queen. <laughs> Let's go. What was more interesting than this is that in the society that he came from, physical touch didn't happen. You never physically touched people. It was always done as a kind of synthesis, right? A kind of, uh, you know, theory between you and somebody else. It's a way to like... And this is supposed to be the brother now? So is he a brother or is he not a brother? You see how they make him not a brother here? But then in the movie coming out, he's a brother. And she's a sister, right? <laughs> so... Just imagine what you really are supposed to be seeing right now, man. Perfect disease, illness, different things like that. And so for the first real time in his life, he's experiencing tactile contact with another human being. More so than that, he's experiencing love. He's experiencing desire. He's having all these feelings that he's never quite really been through before. And so having this kind of experience with her, in a lot of ways, I wouldn't go as far as to say she's in love with him. And I would even go as far as to say he's not necessarily in love with her. If anything, it's more passing curiosity. Now, that will change. That will inevitably change. But of course, she kind of invites him to her tribe. And so of course, he ends up basically chasing her down, following her to that location, and he's taken before the people here. Now, what's kind of baffling is that from Nathaniel Rich's perspective, there shouldn't be any human beings here. Now, I use that based on the real world, right? That, like, uh, primitive human beings appeared maybe something around 300,000 years ago that the anatomical version of ourselves that exists now was probably about 200,000 years ago, and then over time, our minds just progressed to where we are right now. Uh, in Marvel Comics, one thing to know is that when it comes to the evolution of the human race, we're not really given anything before the arrival of the Celestials. Like, even in Marvel Comics, they don't do that. The closest that we ever really get got in terms of those early days is maybe a little bit of discussion about proto-mutants uh, with Gabriel Shepard. The old stories with, uh, not really old stories, I guess they are now. Jesus, I'm old. 20-something-year-old stories, 21-year-old stories by Grant Moore. Yeah, that's that town. That's that town in Hebrew, right? So who's the X-Men? Who are they calling mutants? And if they don't go past the Celestial, <laughs> that's as far as they go. When Atlantis hijacked, when Poseidon was hijacked, and that's as far as they go. They don't go pre hijack. They don't go pre Atlantis. They can't go pre Celestial. They're hijacked city. Morrison <laughs> with new X Men. <laughs> Jesus, I'm old. 
Christ! <laughs> in any event, um, we're not really given an actual origin point for when modern man first appeared in Marvel Comics. So, I can almost guarantee, though, it wasn't 65 million years ago. <laughs> and this race, as is being told, right, this girl Addie and, and her race, we're not really given any information. So, we don't really know if, like, they're time displaced or anything like that. They certainly don't act like it. But Nathaniel is brought before the lasting piece, which is basically their elder, right, the, the leader of the tribe, who kind of gives us this perception that he knows who Nathaniel Richards is going to become, but he doesn't know he's going to become Kang. If anything, it's more of his actions that demonstrate who he is as a person. The fact that he saved Addy's life from a dinosaur, the fact that he killed the dinosaur, basically... This is giving off Avatar vibes now. Like the Jake Sully do. <laughs> and he got accepted into the tribe. He was helping the people. Let's go, man. Um, matter of fact, I'm a belly flop. My belly flop. In fact, let's go right here. Come on, bruh. Come on, bruh. Who's making up this stuff? I know it must be right. Kang. He sets his must sights out on the entirety of the <laughs> galaxy itself, right, right? And then the universe. And over and over and over again, taking his forces with him, he conquers everyone. Yeah. And it's so cool because he says, My 100 year conquest had begun. He says, What had Link that Marvel has kind of created or teased, but, but never, never actually solidified, solidified that Kang the Conqueror may very well, well be descended from, from Dr. Doom. Doom. We, we never, never get a definitive answer on that. that. We, don't we don't know if that's actually the case. case. But, but regardless, regardless of the situation, Doom sees this as a chance to take out two birds with one stone. And, and so what you have is a massive, massive battle, battle that basically takes place between the three of them to a degree. Now, when I say to a degree, it's because it's really more Kang the Conqueror trying to take out Dr. Doom, and then it's Nathaniel trying to reason with Kang. And the reason why he says that is because he says, look, ultimately, the immediate the threat here is, is Dr. Doom, Doom. But, but you, in, in, you know, in, the, in your future, will come back and find me. And when you find me, you're going to take me to the, through the time stream, and you're going to try to correct all the flaws in yourself by correcting those flaws in me, teaching me those lessons. lessons. Never love. Different things along those lines, right? Love is a weakness. The, the, the fact that you fell in love with Ravonna Renslayer is what led to you becoming as weak and incapable as you are. If I don't have any of those weaknesses, I will become ruthless in a way that you never were. I will become every ounce conqueror but at the end of the day i can just teach you those things myself i come from what is in effect your future right like i know your history i know what happens to you like i know these conflicts right i know what happens to you running all the way up until like the 31st century so i know how your battles with the avengers will unfold i know all that stuff so just let me teach you those things right let me teach you how you lost so that you can win and so as a result of that the bargain is struck the deal is made kang says okay they basically end up ejecting uh dr doom from the ship using using you know time mechanics and then once dr doom's out of the picture the response of kang is okay Hey, let's do this. And the response of Nathaniel is no. Right? Doom was 100% right. Kang is not to be trusted. Your time is done. And he fires on him. He literally executes his older self, right? Just kills him right there and then shoots him to death. And it's just this amazing moment where, where Kang says, Kang is dead, long live Kang. And the argument that he makes here, what he's basically saying is, you are going to become me. There's no way you're not. There's no way you can't, right? Like, you are doing exactly what I would have done, right? Like, you, like whether you know it or not, you are walking headlong into this role. You're walking headlong into becoming Kang. And so that's what's so funny here. Because at this point, once Kang is dead, Nathaniel says, okay, now I can execute my plan. I can don the moniker of Ramatut, and I can go back to ancient Egypt, and I can save the life of Ramana Renslayer. I won't use the diode ray that forces her to bend to my will. Instead, like, I will, I will conquer Egypt, right? I will see my younger self. So in effect, it's exactly everything that we saw happening in the last video that we covered. It's all unfolding. The difference here is that the motivation of Ramatut is different, but everything else is the exact same, right? His younger self is there, so on and so forth. And he tells her, come on, man. Egypt, Atlantis, Conqueror, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan has everything to do with Atlantis. <laughs> it gets deep, man, especially if we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Let's go.
Oh, so, like, 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 basically, like, basically, I'm gonna take you to a place where I'm gonna keep you safe. safe. When I'm gonna take you to the Citadel, it's, it's gonna, gonna keep you safe, everything's gonna, gonna be fine, but he still operates this raw metal. By all standards of measurement, he's still, he's still a villain, because, because it's the role he has to play in order to save the life of Ravana. You see how he's falling down this path of becoming Kang, right? Like, you see how, like, he's just continually becoming this guy. And that's when the Fantastic Four show up, and they see him as raw metal, the fight unfolds, and so he says, I did exactly what Kang the Conqueror would have done, right? What raw metal. Now he's a white man again. Now he's a white man again. But now he's a brother. To this whole time, he was a brother that he was drawing him up as a white man. That's crazy. But initially, I fled. So, so regardless of the fact, he's trying to do the thing. But all skin folk ain't kin folk. Differently, in the end, he's doing them the exact same way. The timeline unfolds the exact same way. And that's really the bigger focus here, is that time is not something you can just control and manipulate however you want to. It has a finite form and function. It starts at A and it ends at Z. And then there are things that happen in between where you can kind of fudge them a little bit. But at the end of the day, there are fixed points in the universe's history that cannot be changed. They cannot be modified. They cannot be adjusted. There are universal constants. That, that have, have to, to exist, exist in, in the universe. universe. Can the, the conqueror is a universal concept? Did y'all know that? That there are some fixed points. Keep that in mind. Raw Metut's existence is a universal, universal point in the time stream. stream. That, that cannot, cannot be adjusted. adjusted. It, it always happens. happens. How, How it is, is that he wants, wants it to happen is irrelevant, irrelevant but, but it always happens, happens right? right? He basically, like, like, no matter what would take place no matter what his thought process would be, no matter what would happen, it would be him traveling back as Raw and he would give people science, but he would still be Raw There's no way to escape that. So, what ends up happening is once he flees and gets away as best he can, he ends up in the far-flung future, in 4,000 AD. And, and the first person he's greeted, greeted by is Ravana Renslayer, which begs the question, how did Ravana Renslayer survive from the days of ancient Egypt to now? So, in Earth, in, in the 40th century, century as the, the way that you're seeing this play out, where it's quote-unquote Ramatat who ends up in the 40th century, century that's technically accurate. That's, that's the way it played out in comics originally when it came to Kane the Conqueror. The, the difference here is that this version of Ramatat is not the same as the way it was originally done in Marvel Comics. Just the reason why we're getting this change in origin. That Ramatat was the tried and true Kane, operating under the guise of Ramatat, he was ultimately defeated by the Fantastic Four, fled back to his era, ended up in the 40th century. Century. And, and so, so in, in, in the, the way, way the comics were originally told, it was basically a different version of Ramatat than the one that we see here, right? right? Nathaniel, Nathaniel, his motivation, motivation for why he did what he did when he was Ramatat was, was totally different. different. Him operating as Ramatat here now in the 40th century is different. different. But again, it's Marvel basically solidifying that no matter what Nathaniel does, he will always become Kang, and he'll always follow the path of the person that ends up becoming Kang, that it's unavoidable and there's no way to escape it. Measurements for... Welcome Welcome to Hawthorne Hawthorne Hawthorne. Hawthorne. How y'all enjoying this gang flow? We what do you think this has to do in the world. with the press to flow? Get a little bread? With the gang is flow? Okay. With all these hijacks hiding in between the timelines? For this man. had not invented the chronology, the chronology that, that can contain Kang. I brought, I brought the Chronopolis, the greatest monk of the Buddha, and the, and the most enlightened Shi'ar warrior, warrior priest. And, priest. and, and through, through their teachings, and on rare occasions, occasions over, over their corpses, I came to an understanding. understanding. A master does not allow his love to die. Those are the actions of a boy. A master, master compels that, that which he controls to become, become that, that which he loves. Using, using every bit of Chronopolis' power, I unraveled the very fabric of time. time. I, found I found the thread of fate and made the city, city its loom. loom. And, and from, from it, I wove a machine of constant, constant replication. I injected Ramana Renslayer's very soul into time, into time like, like a dye into the threads of an entire tapestry. Where time had taken her from me, I forced time to do the opposite. The birth of of an infinite, infinite number, number of Ramanas in an infinite, infinite timelines, giving, giving myself infinite chances to save her. Save her. The, plan the plan was genius, it was, it was flawless, until, until it began. began. And, and what we, we end up finding out here, this is one of the interesting things, things that, that Kang really is, it's almost as though Kang has, has this mastery of time, but he's, but he's also a slave to it. Because every single reality that he goes to, no matter what he does, she always dies. But in one reality, she dies from the plague. And in another reality, she actually rejects him, right? And, and it, it takes him by surprise. surprise. But, but no, no matter, matter what he does, does and no, no matter, matter how hard he tries, he always loses Ramana Renslayer. There's, there's nothing he can do to have her. No, no matter what the circumstance is, there's no... And what's it got to do with the girl? I mean, Genghis Khan, I'm sure, once, you know, one oppressed to job. 
one of Preston's daughters, one of Preston John, one of King David's daughters. So <laughs> that's a big part of the equation. What does this have to do with the daughter of Preston John or King David? Who this king, <laughs> you know, who King is Khan wanted to marry, you know what I'm saying? So we're just putting it on perspective because they're using our history, my nine. They're using our stories, our Prestons, who are marvelous, who are marvels, right? <laughs> we are marvels to them. You got this Kang, Preston John Kang battle. Kang appears trying to get Preston John to join him. Did he want to marry King David's daughter? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he gets thrown into the past. As a result, I mean, Preston John has the seat of survival, puts him in suspended animation. <laughs> suspended animation sounds a lot like his natural force never leaving. His eye was never dead. Even though he died, his eye was never dead. His natural force never lessened. That's what it sounded like. Hey, let's get some of this dope spiel. For the dismal, shout out to the bro, Dope Spill Collins. Let's go. Adam, and this time around, we're catching up with Eddie, who made, made his way, way to Brian Kane. But when doing so, and Eddie being brand new to the whole time traveling thing, he finds that Kane has a lesson or two that he wants to teach. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget. Hold up, hold up. They hit that bell up top. Let's go. So we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so for this one, we start off with Eddie in the garden all the way at the end of time. And really with the way that this picks up, it's very much a continuation from issue five. When we had seen Meridius leave Eddie here with the other kings in black just before he had made his time jump. But while Eddie's here, he's noticing a couple of suspicious things because these other two symbiotes or kings in black, they're both watching Eddie, but from a distance. And at this point in time, Eddie hasn't seen Bedlam since their last scuffle. And he still hasn't had a chance to talk to Finnegan, who like we'd seen before, was trying to tell Eddie something, but he never got to when Bedlam attacked him. And when Eddie went to save Finnegan, Bedlam then turned on Eddie and Finnegan was like, yeah, go ahead and kill him, which for Eddie was also very confusing. But for Eddie, while he's waiting in this garden for Meridius, he does notice a familiar feeling of this place. With him not being able to come and go as he pleases, and these two other guys watching him from a distance, and it reminds him of prison. And for a moment, Eddie's like, okay, well, if this is a prison, let me hit my tin cup against the bars and try to communicate with some other inmates. And for that reason, Eddie tries to reach out to the other symbiotes that make up this place. Because if you guys remember, Meridius said that all those other symbiotes are asleep. But when Eddie reaches out to them, he can't detect them at all. So it has him thinking like, what happened to these guys? What did Meridius do to them? And really for Eddie with all these thoughts going through his mind, it also has him thinking that he hasn't been the only voice in his head for a long time. And it's kind of causing him to freak out because all he can think of is the worst. And it also has him feeling alone, which then makes Eddie think of the last time that he had felt this alone, which for him was back when the Venom symbiote had first found him. And when Eddie thinks about this, he's like, man, I abandoned my other to play hero, to play God. And he had pretty much did the same with Dylan. But with him thinking about the symbiote and Dylan, he then sees these flashes of moments in time as if he's right there. And when he sees Dylan, it's in the moment where Bedlam has Dylan and the Venom symbiote hemmed up. And seeing this causes Eddie to flip. Even though he's not sure in this moment what that glimpse meant or what exactly is going on with Dylan or who Dylan is looking at. And at first he thinks like, okay, when Meridius gets back, he'll help me. But then he's like, Nah, man, Meridius is going to help me the same way he did all these other symbiotes that are quote unquote sleep right now and undetectable. And right then, Eddie's like, okay, I've got to get out, get out, get out. And with them doing this, he successfully makes his jump. But he then lands in the 602nd century inside of a war symbiote, which immediately detects Eddie's mind link as it activates. 
And it's right there where Eddie's just like, where did I jump to and what year is this? And right away, this war symbiote that he's jumped into, it acknowledges him as a pilot and it answers his questions. And that's when it tells him he's on his current homeworld, Earth, and it's the year 60,134. But also it lets Eddie know that he's on the flagship Nathaniel in the Conqueror's service. And Eddie tries to get more information from this war symbiote, but then it just tells him that it needs the pilot to supply more information. And right then he's more or less like, yeah, I got nothing for you. Because even with the information provided, he doesn't know what's going on here. But even now, much like before, Eddie can feel the time stream pulling him back. So again, he has to find something to center his mind on to keep him in the here and now, which for whatever reason makes me think of the Days of Future Past movie. But for Eddie, fortunately, something comes along and it does exactly that. Because as soon as he turns around, a ton of soldiers are rushing at him and they're just screaming unauthorized pilot, surrender your symbiote for the conqueror's glory. And initially this war symbiote, it starts to flag Eddie with all types of errors because it's fighting its own soldiers. But Eddie turns this around by asking the symbiote suit, like, hey, buddy boy, can you handle these guys? So it analyzes the situation and it knocks all of these soldiers out while going further to explain to Eddie that it's a war star class class type 2 battle clintar and for that reason it doesn't like being called buddy boy but eddie's like you know i gotta think of something to call you and war star does sound better so eddie goes with that because in the past symbiotes have usually gotten such violent names whether it was scream or riot phage venom like come on or even carnage for that matter and really here eddie Eddie's like, you know, he's trying to turn a new leaf. And this symbiote finds Warstar as a much more acceptable designation, much better than Buddy Boy. But as they make their way forward, the suit signals Eddie for a battle warning because there's a Type 4 Clintar detected ahead. But with seeing this huge thing, Eddie plays it smart because he knows that one-on-one -on -one that this thing would just destroy him. And by way of the mind link with this Warstar suit, he finds a way to disrupt the ship's shields and it just sends this thing flying off into space, which is a real quick introduction and exit for this guy. Unless this is like the origin of Bedlam, who knows. But with Eddie getting rid of this thing, he then notices that it was guarding a door. But as soon as he approaches the door, he finds that it's not locked and behind it, it's Kang. But for Eddie, with them seeing Kang in this room, it's not a surprise to him. Because again, the information from the War Star suit, it's a two-way street, which allowed Eddie to see who's in charge here. And not to mention all the soldiers running around saying, for the conqueror's glory, aboard the flagship Nathaniel, like that might have given it away a little bit too. But for Eddie, with him walking in here and seeing Kang, this is his first time meeting him. But for Kang, he lets Eddie know that he's known him for years across eons, which is always a funny thing because much of Kang's past is everyone else's future, with a mix up of many years before anyone from our present day was born. But it's here where Kang goes on to tell Eddie that 10,000 years ago, for him, for Kang, him and Eddie had met on a bridge much like this one. And when they did, Kang had shown Eddie the universe, each galaxy the size of a single grain of sand. And Kang had told Eddie if he'd played his game on his board by his rules, then all of this could, could be Eddie's. Eddie's. Which really sounds like, like a double tempting Jesus. Now remember, this is the second time he's mentioned, oh, yeah, you know, the, the devil this and yeah, but the devil gives you that. So this Genghis Khan is really taking this adversary devil role. You know, real, 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 uh... <laughs> real personal i mean this seems to be you know a lot of connection with this adversary flow you know what i'm saying what's this got to do with the adversary frequency is the adversary frequency going from you know <laughs> melanated conqueror to melanated conqueror charles the fifth to Genghis Khan, <laughs> and all that before and after you know what i'm saying so is this like a transfer of energy? Or is it all the same thing? Columbus, all the same thing. Just on the mountaintop type of thing. And in this moment, Eddie has a similar response. He's like, you know, gang, did I tell you where you could shove it? But what's interesting is that Kang tells Eddie that his response was quite different at the time. Because 10,000 years ago, Eddie was more so in the mood to listen. Which right there really raises the question as far as why was it that Eddie was so cooperative at that point in time? And also how far ahead of this Eddie is that Eddie? But also in this moment, Kang goes to attack Eddie and not so much in a malicious manner, but really more so as if he's starting Eddie's training from here in this moment when Eddie first met Kang. And as he does, you can see the images behind them of different moments in time just changing. 
And through the course of this, Eddie just kind of figures it out as he goes. And he gets the War Star suit to help him out by telling it that this is just a defensive drill. And if they kick Kang off the ship, then they get a bonus. And really, that's how Eddie gets the suit to fire different projectiles in order to combat Kang in this sparring session slash training that Kang has started with no warning. But through the course of this, with every attack that Eddie's using, Kang is able to stop it either with the Time Sword or with his shields. But it's pretty hard to attack someone who can freeze time because every attack is just going to slow down and it's nearly impossible to connect. And it's here where Kang tells Eddie that he's in a battle that he has no understanding of while waging a war that he understands even less. And really and truly, his intention here is to help Eddie. But Eddie's still not sure if he can trust Kang because he's Kang and his reputation precedes him or reseeds him. You know what I'm trying to say. But for Eddie with them hearing this and going through this sparring match, he then tells the War Star suit to scale him down to his normal size, but then also create for Eddie the same weapon that Kang has, essentially making this War Star suit make him a time sword. And when Kang sees this, he tells Eddie that according to Eddie's timeline, this is the first lesson that Kang had taught him which is to know when your enemy has a superior weapon and then make it your own. But then when Kang says this, he then parries Eddie and cuts his hand off, which in a matter of seconds just grows back. And for Eddie, when this happens, he's more humiliated than actually like physically hurt. And as his hand grows back, he finds that he feels more stable, unlike moments earlier where he could feel the time stream pulling at him. And it's here where Kang lets Eddie know that he used the time sword to pin Eddie's temporal form in this moment. Because like we'd seen before, Eddie had been struggling with resisting the pull from the time stream. And Kang is able to solve that problem for Eddie in this moment. But this also raises a lot of suspicion for him because he's thinking like, how does Kang know so much about him? Because again, Eddie's not really sure if he can trust Kang. But throughout this conversation, he does realize that at some point in time, he trusted Kang enough to the point of where Eddie told Kang all of this information. But even with Eddie struggling with the idea of whether or not he can trust Kang, he does decide he'll cautiously trust Kang for now. Because for Eddie, as far as what he knows, this is the only way he can get the help that he needs in order to find his way to Dylan. But then it's here throughout the conversation where Kang is like, well, you gotta excuse me because I need to go to the little conference room. But for Kang, instead of heading to the restroom, we see him head to his private quarters where he's talking to someone who's really more or less asking for Kang's feedback on his encounter with Eddie. And Kang lets this person know that Eddie was suspicious, confused, and quite violent. But even with Eddie's suspicion about Kang's motives, Kang tells this person that Eddie hasn't figured out that Kang is baiting him for someone else's trap. And the main reason why Eddie hasn't figured it out at this point is because who could possibly plan for this random appearance that Eddie's made at this random point in time, which brought him right to the flagship Nathaniel. And when Kang says who could possibly plan for that, and it's right then when we see who he's talking to, and it is, of course, Meridius, who again has just been creating this path before Eddie with intention, while also just making it seem like Eddie's carving this path on his own. And that right there makes you think like, is he? Or is he? But either way, we'll have to wait and see. Wow. Oh, wow. It's a more and more war, my nigga. Meridius. You know, sounds a lot like Mercury, man. <laughs> yeah, Thoth got his hands all over the place. You might be checking out uh, the Ant-Man flow, the Wasp flow. They got a lot of quantum drop in there as well. I'll do a quick belly flop. As promised, let's go. Shout out emergency. Can we write existence? And shatter timelines. Shatter timelines. You cannot trust him. I don't care who this guy is. I just lost so much. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania video for MODOK. Lots of questions about what's going on with him in the trailer, in the movie, because they're using one of the villains from the first movie as MODOK with a huge twist. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. This is just the tip of the spear. Kang the Conqueror is going to be the main villain of Avengers 5 King Dynasty. They even tease it in the trailer, the new Dynasty, quote unquote, in text. So they really want to start off Marvel Phase 5 with a banger just to show how. So this uh, black ass Kang is going to be taking over, man. They're going to give you Kang from the 
Hijack Con perspective, from the Genghis Khan perspective, from the Conqueror perspective. Notice they chilling on the Prester John Marvel. Then I giving you a Prester John Marvel, right? Then I giving you a Blue Marvel, right? Pay attention, man. We talking quantum for the dismount. And I know we just scratching the surface. I know it's so much more. This is just part one of the Kang series. Cause I know my nog is gonna be hitting the comments with a lot of drop on Kang and quantum and all that. And my nog is right here in front of our face, ball man. We can't make this stuff up. Let's go, man. And hey, we in a victory lap. How worse he's going to be than Thanos. In Ant-Man 3 is going to be the official beginning of Marvel Phase 5. Everything before this was Marvel Phase 4. But during the trailer, there's a couple of scenes featuring MODOK. One with the mask on, and then one without his mask, with Kang as he escorts Ant-Man and Cassie through one of his portals to a place that seems like it's overlooking the area where he wants Ant-Man to steal the device to help him complete his time travel platform from the comics. This area here, so that he can control all of reality and win the new Kang Multiverse War. And when he's not wearing the mask, he looks just like comic book MODOK with the massive floating head, the gold helmet around him, the big gem in his forehead, the tiny little arms. And if you haven't read the comics, this is what he looks like. Like they even did a MODOK TV show starring Patton Oswalt a little while ago. It only ran for one season because it was before Kevin Feige took over all the Marvel shows. So when he took over, he canceled a lot of those Marvel TV shows. Quite the big day, sir. They're unveiling the statue depicting the other statue being made to commemorate the even bigger statue of you at the center of the city. While you're away, we'll have your Iron Throne cleaned. That was also sort of like an Elseworld spin on the MODOK character because they treated him more of a comedic sitcom kind of way with Marvel tropes and a bunch of Marvel characters and stuff going on during it. But in the trailer, if you zoom and enhance on MCU MODOK's face, you can see that it's Darren Cross from the first movie, Corey Stoll's character, character Yellow, Yellow Jacket. Jacket. Somehow, Somehow it seems like, like he's been, been turned into MODOK, meaning that he didn't, didn't die during, during the first, first movie. movie. At, At the end, end of the, the first Batman movie, movie, he defeated him by destroying the inside of his Yellow Jacket, which is causing him to shrink down uncontrollably into the quantum realm. And they treated it in a very WTF comedic kind of way, letting you wonder what might have happened to him. Like, a lot of people just assumed that he had been destroyed here. Like, he shrunk down into nothingness and been crushed. Like, he'd literally he turned, turned into nothing. nothing. When, when, in fact, he just crashed, crashed into the quantum, quantum realm. And, and based on the way that he's floating around here with Kang, the others not being guarded the way the Cassie and Ant are, it seems like Kang might be the person who transformed him into MODOK. The big question is why he would do that. Like, why not just repair his yellow jacket suit? Maybe the suit had been damaged in the crash, or maybe his body was too badly damaged when he crashed. Because the whole idea is that Kang wants to escape the quantum realm. Wouldn't he try to steal the Pym particles if that was possible? Yellow Jacket was able to use his suit because it was also using a form of Pym Particles. It sounds like when he crashed in the Quantum Realm, they might have been used up. Like, for some reason, the Kang wasn't able to continue using his technology to escape. It That's a good question for the dismount. Is Kang caught up in the quantum is he stuck in quantum <laughs> is he stuck in time travel has he been traveling so much he got stuck got some technology got him stuck did, did the presta catch him by the heel <laughs> pull his ass back down is he trying to get free from the quantum but he's missing some pieces you know, what they're doing in the movie is they're doing part of MODOK's origin story from the comics where he asks Kang to turn him into a much better weapon capable of defeating Ant-Man surviving to the quantum realm, where MODOK starts out as a normal human and then gets turned into this giant floating head. And this is just the result of what Kang turned Darren Cross into. In the comics, MODOK is an acronym that stands for Mechanized Organism Designed Only for Killing, but he started out as a normal scientist named George Tartleton who worked for AIM, which was founded by his father. Like, he was just a normal guy working on the team. AIM performed experiments and tried to turn him into a version of this cybernetic floating head in an attempt to create a supercomputer called MODOK with a C. The C in his name stood for computing. He wasn't meant to be a weapon or anything like that. They just wanted to create a special supercomputer. Man, what has Modoc got to do with Murdoch? Just research Murdoch, M U R D O C or D O K, Murdoch, the god, this this power they were worshiping. And what has Murdoch got to do with the talking head, you know, <laughs> with the Yaku big head scientist, man? <laughs> now we got to factor in the Yaku flow, the big head scientist flow. It's a more and more war. Computer. But George Tarleton used his newfound power to rebel and renamed himself MODOK with a K that stood for the killing. He went on a rampage and started fighting Captain America in his comics. 
They did a version of his origin story during the Marvel Avengers game where you meet George Tarleton when he's still human and then later after he's been transformed into MODOK. Small connection to World War Hulk in the MCU. I just did a video about the new World War Hulk movie that they're working on in the background. In the comics, MODOK was a part of the Intelligentsia. They did a version of that during She-Hulk. But in the comics, the Intelligentsia were the ones responsible for turning Thunderbolt Ross into Red Hulk. They siphoned Hulk's gamma power during the World War Hulk event and gave it to Thunderbolt Ross. Obviously, they're not going to do it exactly this way in the MCU, because <coughs> MODOK is doing something completely different. They've already done AIM with a completely different movie in Iron Man 3, and they've already done the Intelligentsia as more of a comedic joke in She-Hulk. But they are turning the Harrison Ford version of Thunderbolt Ross into Red Hulk in the MCU, and it'll just, just have, have a different backstory that will flow with the new characters and story that they don't already. Like, like Val will be a much bigger part, part of that in the MCU. What seems like is going on with MODOK during Ant-Man 3, just in the MCU version of the character, is they're going to say that Darren Cross MODOK at the start of the movie is more of a sub-boss for Kang that he uses against Ant-Man and the others. Like, he still wants to get revenge against Ant-Man at the beginning of the movie. You tried to kill me and I swore revenge all these years. So during the first half of the movie, he's trying to do that. But I believe that Marvel wants to keep the MODOK character around long term. Darren Cross will wind up surviving by the end of the movie. He'll also eventually try to help them defeat Kang, and they'll give him more of a redemption kind of arc, but in a comedic way. Like the whole concept of the character, Darren Cross, total dirtbag in the first movie that they clown on for pretty much the entire movie. And that just continues in Quantumania. But by the end, he turns that around and tries to help them win. I don't know which future stories they want to use MODOK in, but I think he'll appear in future Marvel movies, Disney Plus series. And they'll just treat him more like an anti-hero, like he still is a genius. And obviously he does have all these huge weapon upgrades, so he is super powerful now. But because they already did AIM during Iron Man 3 as Aldrich Killian's company, and they're probably not going to do Intelligentsia again. They just had to use him during some different villain team-up. I think part of the reason why they wanted to use MODOK in this movie in this way is because the Ant-Man movie is typically more comedic in tone, and they wanted to do MODOK at some point, and he's kind of a ridiculous character, like that's kind of already baked into the character, like he's a giant floating head. So it just seems more natural to do him in this darker, comedic way with a character like Darren Cross, like he was already somebody that Ant-Man clowned on. When he comes back with all the powerful upgrades, like you probably see him in the mask for the first time, like, ah, I finally have you, Ant-Man, and Ant-Man will just continue to clown on him. Like, it'll still be funny in a dark kind of way, because he is still so ridiculous. Like, yeah, you're more powerful, but you still look really ridiculous. And when I say he'll probably try to redeem himself by helping Ant-Man defeat Kang by the end of the movie, it's because they probably will not succeed. Like, the whole idea in the trailer is they want to make it seem like Ant-Man is going to sacrifice himself because he can't beat Kang. He even clowns on him, like, oh, you thought that you could beat me? That's hilarious. And he replies, I didn't have to win, I just had to make sure that we both lose. Like, he's going to try and sacrifice himself and kill Kang in the process, prevent him from completing his time travel platform and escaping. But because I believe this version of Kang is the version of Kang that the Avengers is going to face. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Gang is Khan wants to complete his time travel platform. He, he wants to get the hell out of something. He wants to escape somewhere. His gang is Khan... Is Genghis Kang caught in the quantum time travel paradox, man? <laughs> hey, one more minute. In Avengers 5, King Dynasty, he would have to escape. He would have to survive in some way, which I think means, obviously, that Ant-Man will survive as well and continue to be a part of Avengers 5 or Avengers 6. If you remember, the last couple of Ant-Man movies have ended with a big twist that somebody seemingly dies or disappears into the quantum realm. Like, during Ant-Man the Wasp, Ant-Man gets trapped in the quantum realm for just, like, a really short time period, but it winds up being five years in normal time, in the normal world. What might wind up happening during this movie is that he, MODOK, tried to defeat Kang or stop him from escaping, and even though it might seem like they're successful, he winds up escaping, Kang winds up escaping, and it'll... So everyone's trying to take down Kang. They also need Kang. You know, and it only seems like Ant Man winds up dying right during here, the movie, man, but he really ain't gets no bro to for a, a couple to more years. To. <laughs> Should you root for Kang? Should you root for Kangas? It's a lot happening, man. <laughs> it's too much fun breaking this down. Until, Until the, the events, events of Avengers, Avengers 5, 5 or Avengers 6. 6. Without, Without them completely repeating the plot of Avengers, of Avengers Infinity, Infinity War, Avengers Endgame, Endgame where Ant-Man Ant Man gets saved, saved by the rat. rat. Chris Pratt, the rat, rat who saved, saved the entire universe, universe the MCU. MCU. Somebody, Somebody give, give that rat, rat a medal. There were so, so many jokes about that after Avengers Endgame came out. Like, seriously, it was the rat that saved the MCU. 
We are, we are supposed, supposed to see multiple, multiple variants, variants of King, King in, in future Marvel, Marvel movies, movies, but they didn't say exactly which movies, which Disney, Disney Plus series we'd see variants of King in. in. I, I think part, part of the idea... idea... So which variant of Kang has conquered the Americas? Which variant of Kang has conquered you, my knight, and how many times? Have you been conquered by the same damn king? Oh, 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 with his red tights. With his red tights, man. We'll be back, man. Like I said, I know my knock is going to pop off. Share some drop on this king flow. And uh, we're just having fun, man. Just look, look out for so much more music. I'm about to drop some more music for my jigger on you, man. The Tribal Mafia is still popping off. Brand new tracks, man. And, you know, it's 2023, but it's the fifth wave, and it's all happening. I'm enjoying all my noggers and everything you're doing. And shout out to the cons, man, all across the plane. Hey, yeah, hop to the cons, representing the Presta. <laughs> yeah, man. Because the Kang couldn't hang <laughs> with old Presta job. <laughs> hey, the water for you. You know, your patience, your your support, my noggers, and all your energy all along the way. Tribe up. Stay up. Vibe up, my noggers. Keep your vibe high. You know, uh, keep your veggies going, man. Keep, <laughs> keep your exercise high. Keep everything at an all-time premium. Push yourself like you've never pushed yourself. Start stretching, man. Stretch your bones. Stretch out your ankle bones. Get more flexible than you've ever been. Get faster than you ever been. Get more endurance. Get your cardio flow. Be the most supreme, superior con that you could ever be, man. You're the tribe of Hawaii. We're the tribe of Hawaii. It's one try, one vibe. So vibe up, my naga. Tribe up, my naga. And rise up, my naga. Coom to the cop.